Hello, SciPy. Um, my name is Kelly Thompson, and I work at the University of Minnesota Libraries in Minneapolis. Um, and I'm here today to talk to you about libraries data. Um, I had one of those stickers earlier that said, ask me about, and I had written libraries. And then I realized that at a Python conference, that maybe wasn't the most clear thing to suggest. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, serials holdings data in the research library. And I'll tell you what that means as we go along. Um, so I work on the secret fifth floor of this building, Wilson Library. Um, by title, I am a data and systems analyst, um, but by training and background, I am a metadata librarian, um, and before that, a seed scientist. Um, I was recently reclassified into an IT track, um, as I've been doing more and more scripting um, and automation of workflows, um, in particular using Python. Um, see. So I've been using Python since I was a graduate student in library and information science, um, but I've really been, um, over the last two years, incorporating this into my regular workflows. And um, for the sake of scope, I'm going to talk about one particular problem in um, the environment of the large academic research library, which is collection management. Um, and we use scientific Python libraries in a lot of our workflows now, so thanks to the community. Um, but I just want to focus on one particular problem where we're applying this set of tools to keep that scope manageable. So, Libraries have been collecting, stewarding, and providing access to information objects for decades, in some cases centuries. Our collections cover an incredible time span. Some of our oldest materials are cuneiform tablets from between 3000 and 2000 BCE to the most recent electronic medical journal article indexed in PubMed. We are stewards of physical resources, yes, but more and more we are facilitators of access to information and scholarship services, increasingly in digital formats. And because we are stewards of centuries of physical manifestations of intellectual outputs, you can imagine that we have reached capacity in our physical spaces, despite the fact that we have built a giant cathedral to books in a cavern in a cliff overlooking the Minnesota, Mississippi River, which runs through our campus, <laughs> seen here. Um, this problem comes at a time when our space, as many on campus, are challenged to be more creative and flexible with our physical space. We are being asked by our administrators to create more student-friendly study spaces, flexible spaces for teaching and learning, supporting new modes of pedagogy, cafes, group study spaces, data visualization labs, and so on. At a time when our physical footprint of resources is at its largest, we need it to be shrinking. For the majority of disciplines we serve, electronic resources have become the format of choice. Most of these resources are in the form of serials or continuing resources a broad category used by librarians to encompass publications such as journals, society and conference proceedings, government documents issued on a recurring basis, book series, etc. Serials published by for-profit publishers have price tags that continue to climb at rates much higher than inflation at a time when our budgets are stagnant or reduced. The number of publishers and vendors who can provide us with these resources has shrunk to less than a handful, affectionately known as the big four. This environment is leading to a louder call to critically examine our practices in this area. Libraries have identified a number of actions we can take to work in this problem space, such as forming open access publishing units to keep the means of production of scholarship in the hands of scholars, educating researchers on their intellectual property rights as authors. If you are about to sign a contract signing away your copyright and you work at a university, please contact your librarian because we are happy to help you with boilerplate language for negotiating to keep as many of your rights as possible. Um, and we are critically examining our relationships with our vendors. It is with the vendor relations, the negotiations of the contracts we sign in order to access electronic resources or license them, that we encounter a big question of access. If we decide to discontinue purchasing a title, how much, if any, of the content we have been licensing will we retain access to? The answer can range from none to some to unknown, this post-cancellation access also brings up the issue of digital preservation. If a journal publisher is acquired by a larger publisher or goes out of business, do we trust that they will continue to provide indefinite access to the retrospective electronic resources we previously had contracted with them to provide? Ongoing access to these resources is a big question, and library consortia have been working together to address it. 
And in the meantime, we have to keep moving forward with our work and providing access to our communities of library users fulfilling our other roles on campuses. Fortunately, now is also a time when additional intercampus collaborations are springing up to address these questions. One example is the increasing movement among library consortia and membership organizations to collectively inventory disparate resources and create shared catalogs or meta collections of national consortial collections, drawing from the collections which individual local institutions steward and agree to preserve in place. These types of sharing arrangements have existed for a long time. Our library users have been fondly familiar of our interlibrary loan service for decades, but these consortial relationships have become even more important in today's environment. These relationships can offer us new decision-making frameworks and our collection management policies. Through these sharing arrangements, we make commitments to retain specific titles on behalf of the larger community of libraries. We gauge the type and expediency of access we could expect to access materials retained by other institutions or through post-cancellation access via our vendors or digital repositories. And we balance these assumptions as we make retention or withdrawal decisions and policies. So we need to get rid of non-unique, non-rare, unused resources to make room for ways of using library spaces in support of new ways of teaching and learning. We need to know which titles we hold in a physical format on our shelves, in an electronic format. We need to know if we have ongoing access if we cancel our subscription. And we need to know if the title is preserved in a trusted repository. We have made commitments to consortial efforts to retain certain materials on behalf of a larger community. And we are hoping to rely on the other community efforts to supply materials outside the scope of outside the scope of what we wish to retain. Only then can we start looking at these candidate titles to see if they are in any of our weeding target locations. And ideally, we would like some kind of measure, such as number of volumes, since the bosses are thinking in linear feet of shelf space. That's my joke about measuring. So our goals for this data analysis are to compare physical holdings of resources to electronic resources, filter those matches for post-cancellation access from backfiles lists maintained by our electronic resources librarian, Sunshine Carter, who is amazing, filter for items held in trusted repositories, which our administrators have approved as part of this policy. Um, this includes Portico and uh, BTAA SPR stands for Big Ten Academic Alliance Shared Print Repository. Um, and we may be adding JSTOR, but this is fluid. Um, and then we would, of course, want to exclude any titles where we have made retention com commitments. Um, currently, this is mainly through HathiTrust Shared Print Repository, which is a preserve in place um, arrangement and our government documents, since we are a federal depository library. Um, and we need to keep track of everything that we're doing as we do all of these um, weeding or withdrawal or deduplication projects because um, we are one of the libraries who send resources for scanning to the Google Books project. Um, and as part of our agreement with them, um, copies of those scans are deposited in Hathi Trust. And if we can establish that we at one point had ownership of those materials, our authenticated users can access those. Um, so, there's, there's a lot of data stuff going on under the hood of all of these scenarios. So um, to make it even more complicated, we're talking not about monographs or books, but about serials, resources that continue on and have their own sorts of lives. Um, the life of the party. Um, serials um, yield what I would consider to be some of the most complex bibliographic inventory data in our library systems. It's important to know that serials are complicated works. They're born, they merge, they split up, they change their names slightly on every issue cover, they spawn subseries, sometimes they die, and sometimes they just kind of ghost on you. Serials have volumes, issues, their frequency of publication varies, editors retire, etc. This all means that serials have complicated relationships with each other that are challenging to represent with data. It also means that when we want to look at a title and compare online versus print, we often need to look at a cluster or a family of records. While print serials usually have one record per major title change, electronic serials often have vendor-provided records which often compile an entire run under one title regardless of title changes. Um, 
usually the most recent form. We hope that our records have what we refer to as slinker fields, or 76x, 77x, and 78x, if there are any catalogers listening, um, which describe a relationship between the title described by the record and another title. Each field describes a specific type of relationship, which is further described by what we call indicators and subfields in the data structure. The most important data in these fields are identifiers. Um, we also have what are called enum cron or enumeration and chronology data for each serial run, which uh, include uh, issue and volume numbers, um, dates of production and whatnot. And these are as much of a hot mess as you would expect. Um, Library data is legacy data. All of it is kind of a long tail. Um, it's, it's been around for a long time and it's a continually worked on data set. Most libraries use a large data system referred to as an integrated library system or ILS to manage the majority of their data about library collections. Almost all libraries purchase rights to use these systems from an ever decreasing number of vendors for large sums of money. The system that we use has what I think of as a tiered inheritance data model. You have bibliographic or descriptive data. You have holdings, which indicates libraries and locations, item level data in the form of a record for every barcode, um, and then um, bibliographic records for, I lost my mouse, for every barcode in the system. Um, that's electronic, um, and then, or not barcode in the system, every work that's electronic. Um, and to that, there are what we call portfolios or carriers of URLs and associated access data, um, and those may or may not belong to an electronic collection. So we're also transversing trees in addition to having really messy data. Um, so a bit about the format of libraries data. Um, Library data is stored in a format called MARC, which is an acronym for Machine Readable Cataloging. It was developed in the 1960s by a systems analyst at the Library of Congress. It was developed to facilitate the transition from paper card catalogs to the first computer catalogs. So this is a system that um, has been around since the 60s, over 50 years, um, and we're still using it. And while some aspects of the standard have changed, in particular the content standards, um, the majority of it, including structure, um, have not. Here's an example of a typical MARC serial record as I would interact with it in the wild. The standard prescribes the MARC record structure of leader, directory, fixed fields, and variable field data. The standard contains rules for which content to put in which field, two indicators for each field that carry coded data and subfields. The content of these data elements is ruled by additional standards, previously AACR2, now RDA, often a hybrid. Um, the resulting records can be serialized in a number of formats, binary, mnemonic, and XML are the most common. Serials are typically registered for an ISSN or international serial number. Um, this is typically a nine character identifier, four digits, um, followed by a hyphen, then four more digits or the letter X. Um, these are some examples of the many identifiers in the MARC record that I just showed you. So onto the Python. <laughs> Um, now is the time for some caveats. I am a domain knowledge expert when it comes to library data. However, I am not an expert when it comes to all things Python. Um, this is not a talk about how we created the most advanced and genius thing. It's a talk about how we've applied these open scientific Python tools in our particular context, and it saved us a lot of time and helped us get answers that we were unable to get in a timely fashion otherwise. Um, so, most libraries undertaking these kinds of analyses have had to struggle through a lot of manual work to do this. Um, our catalog right now, I think our bibliographic records are like over four million and our individual items are over seven million. Um, so this is way too big for Excel. It's not big data, but it's too big for Excel. So um, we need new tools and I'm here to say if you are a librarian, you can do this too. Um, so one of the um, first steps in a Python analysis of libraries data has to be getting the data into a form appropriate for analysis. For this work, I have been extracting the data into pandas data frames. So in order to get something that looks like this into a data frame, we can either manually use a program called markedit to extract tab delimited values from the fields we are looking for and read the text file. Um, while this method is very fast and provides a handy user interface, it doesn't give us the same control that programmatically 
parsing the records does, where we can implement conditional loops and pre-filter the data. Um, Primark has an active Google group where people are happy to answer questions, and the primary authors um, were Ed Summers, Mark Matienzo, Gabriel Farrell, and Jeffrey Spear, and I think Ed Summers does a lot of the ongoing maintenance for that, so that's a good resource. Um, so this is an example of what a Primark call would be. This is the beginning of one of the functions in a script that I use to parse the serials data. So um, for each record in a batch of records, um, pull out the identifier, um, look for an O35 field, which I know is where the OCLC number is. This is a lot of acronyms and jargon. Um, and I only want the subfield A because I know that is the actual identifier, not a linked identifier, a canceled identifier, a previous identifier, etc. cetera. Um, but if I do find any of those other subfields, capture that data because it's a related OCN and I might want to try to link that when I do all of my clustering. So you get the sense that um, there are a lot of conditionals that we're looking for in this data. Um, and I know this is quite small, um, so hopefully if we have a little bit of time at the end, I can run you through uh, a notebook or in a Jupyter lab. Um, and we can zoom in on some more of that. But this is basically, I've read in some MARC records. Um, I've got them in lists in the data frame because that is what made most sense to me as I was working on this. A lot of records have multiple identifiers. Um, and if you're new to Python and you haven't worked with pandas yet, um, allow me to plug it for you because you're in for a treat. Um, it's like a spreadsheet with magic powers. Um, they're like database tables in that you can perform database style joins on them, but there are also a lot of built-in methods um, that make the work really nice. Um, another tool that I use a lot is just regular expressions. Um, so we're looking for ISSNs, but um, a lot of times the data is old or messy, so I want to get rid of anything before I do any matching that um, might give a false positive match. There we go, got my mouse back. Okay, um, so like I said, our database is over um, it's probably about 50 years old, um, and people with varying knowledge levels and um, experience levels have entered that data. So I'm always doing these checks on the data before I'm trying to do any grouping. Okay. So I'm also using replace functions to clean data, um, and then I'm working on grouping. So I had original, this is also a story about refactoring code. I had originally started trying to do this um, with list comprehension um, because I had the data in the form of lists because there's multiple identifiers per record. Um, this was incredibly slow. And um, I wanted, I, had, I learned about the pandas group by function and I wanted to be able to use that. Um, but you can't use that on a multi-valued cell, you need tidy data. Um, so I was doing a lot of research. Um, I came across all of the stuff about split apply combine and thought about theoretically that. So I had filtered out into just the records that I knew had matches and tried to do that, but it's still too slow. Um, but I had something that worked and I had needed a deliverable for my boss to take to a committee. Um, so um, as my colleague at the University of Minnesota, Willie Lee, um, writes, hashtag pro tip, get working software before you worry about optimizing. Um, so I took their advice and I did what I needed to do, but I wasn't satisfied with that solution because I knew we were going to keep having to do these types of um, matches and, and clustering. So um, I ended up finding on a stack overflow post, um, in Hive, you would use a, a um, function called explode to take multi-valued um, data points and, and make them into individual rows. So I was able to use that to reformat my data um, in order to use the built-in functions, which are so much faster <laughs> than trying to do um, by hand kind of clustering algorithms. So, um, and this is kind of like, I, I think of it like normal form when you're doing database um, design. So shout out to my databases professor, Howe Shea. Um, but 
and this is also related to tidy data, um, one observation per cell, and then repeating that as necessary. Um, I'm using indexes as temporary record identifiers. They're, these records do have actual identifiers, but they're long and unwieldy, and this makes it easier. Um, once I have a data, the data in the format I need, um, call the pandas group by function, parse the group object to get the group numbers, and put them into a data frame with the record IDs. Um, because we've split out those multiple identifiers, um, this is going to yield multiple group numbers per record ID. So we've come back to a problem again of multivalued cells. Um, so we need to reduce the multiple group numbers into a single group number, then what I refer to, I'm sure there's a real term, but defrag that list. So instead of 0, 4, and 12, you have 0, 1, and 2 as your group numbers. Um, and then sort by group number for display. So um, I know this is probably really rudimentary, um, but this is a thought process that took me a lot of time to process through, and I think it was um, helpful for me to think about it. But if you know of a better way to do any of these things, please approach me. I'm very open to um, learning all of those things. I'm excited about it. Um, so I run this algorithm multiple times over the data, um, clustering by ISSN and OCLC number. Um, we could theoretically do other things. Um, after clustering, I add in my other data and um, do the filters that I talked about on that goal spreadsheet. The other data lives in totally different systems. Um, it often comes to us in the form of tab delimited or comma separated values or spreadsheets. And so, um, Pandas is also really nice in that I can read in those CSVs, do what I need to do, get the identifiers I need, and then perform those database style joins on my data. Um, I also use pandas to do um, slices as I'm filtering for those different indicators. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that um, a lot of the outputs that we're looking for are spreadsheets that will be read by humans, um, and that's another reason why I opted to put a lot of the data in lists within the data frame, because I knew that the people who would eventually be making the final decision about whether or not to retain a title would want to see all of that data, um, and there's a lot of validation and checking that goes on. So um, it's kind of a unique scenario in that our end consumers actually want to look at spreadsheet data. Um, it's not going into like a visualization or something. Um, so, so far what I've been working on with the Enum Quran data that you remember is um, mostly working with the dates as years. So um, the standard date time library cannot <laughs> handle the messiness of what is serials and numcron data, um, but um, I've built a suite of regular expressions, so um, I'm working on next, trying to do that with the issue and volume number, um, inspired by um, the package pi call number, which was presented about at Code for Lib conference this year. Um, so next steps, um, my electronic resources librarian has requested a, a output of data that says percentage overlap. So this percent of the physical volumes are represented by electronic access, are represented by post-cancellation access, are represented by preserved things. Um, that's really complicated. <laughs> um, but I'm working on that as well. Um, so that would give us more granular coverage data. Um, I'm investigating querying these data sources on the fly because right now we extract all of the data and then process it and these are living systems. Stuff is added and withdrawn every day. So um, being able to have data that's not instantly old would be a, an advantage in this process. Um, I'd like to turn some of these functions into a Python package for other people who are working with serials data. Um, this would um, be an extension maybe of the PyMark um, and I would like to try out some different data structures, so um, maybe trying out, you don't have to put everything into a data frame. <laughs> um, the benefits of this um, are reproducible workflows, it's extensible and it uses actively maintained tools. Um, the challenges have been chugging through those large data sets and the data sources themselves. Um, 
We do have a Jupyter Hub on campus through the um, high performance uh, cluster at the Supercomputing Institute. Um, Mike Mulligan, I think, presented on that here like two years ago. So um, I'm interested in seeing if we can get some space on that cluster to try running these to, to improve the speed. Um, when I first was trying to do the list comprehension grouping, um, it would take overnight to run the script. Now it's just a couple of hours to run all of the cleaning and the grouping and the um, re-indexing. So, um, thank yous and um, sources. Sean Everkamp got me started on metadata in Python when I was a grad student and she was my supervisor. Um, she also did a really great workshop called Measure Your Metadata with Sarah Rubinow, Matt Miller, and Josh Hedrill, which you can find on GitHub. Um, and that was my first foray into pandas. Um, so if you're looking to get started, that's a great place. Um, my database professor and grad advisor, How is Shea. Um, and then I also use data carpentry, Python-free colleges quite a bit in learning, especially with the database style joins. Um, and then my coworkers, Stacy Trail and Sunshine Carter, who also work on these serials projects. Um, so I don't know if we have time for questions, um, but feel free to reach out. I'll be around, and I will be at the beer garden this evening <laughs> if you would like to talk about libraries data. And I'm on Twitter. Thank you. Um, we uh, are out of time, but we're running up against a break right now. So if anybody has a quick question they'd like to ask, and our speaker is willing to answer it, then we can do that. I would just uh, remind you to ask your questions in the form of a question. Hi, are you concerned about uh, possibilities of misentry or surprise book loss or anything like that? Are you doing anything to prevent that sort of thing? Yeah, so we have flags within the database that um, let us know if something has already been withdrawn, if it's lost or missing, different statuses like that. So I filter for that when I do the data export from our main library system. Um, we're always concerned about the um, possibility for false positives in the matching. Um, but at this point, none of this is like the final decision maker. Someone is actually looking at all of this. Um, and we have staff who specialize in that. And this is, this is the most useful as a tool, as a way to create candidate lists for someone to look at. So instead of starting with like a giant batch of things to say like, here are some candidates that it, it makes sense for someone to actually spend some human time with. So but that's a really good question that we think about a lot. Awesome, great. Let's thank our speaker one more time.